harder than it's ever been in my entire career, and I've been doing this 30 some years. I've never experienced something this horrific. We're seeing something that could have been prevented. We're seeing people getting really sick. We're seeing people dying. The reality is that out of all of our patients, they're all COVID positive. The reality is a lot of them will die. The message from doctors and nurses across Oregon could not be more clear. Hospitals are in crisis, full of COVID patients. The majority of the people that are coming in are regretting not getting the vaccine. I would be lying if I say there isn't anger for people who are vaccine deniers. There are more people in the hospitals with COVID this month than at any point during the pandemic. It's taking a huge toll on the doctors and nurses charged with caring for those patients. A lot of people are like, I'm done. I, I can't keep doing this because it's gonna destroy my own health. It's kind of like watching the airplane crash. You see it coming but there's nothing you need to stop it. I'm Pat Doris. Recently, my colleague Christine Pitawanich and I were both granted access to two intensive care units in Oregon full of COVID patients. It was a rare opportunity to see and hear from the people fighting on the front lines against this disease. It's also a difficult thing to see. The next 30 minutes includes descriptions of death and may not be appropriate for everyone. I visited OHSU's medical ICU in Portland and spoke to five nurses. They're overwhelmed, frustrated, and pleading with people to get the vaccine. It's the same feeling in Central Oregon. The leaders of St. Charles Medical Center in Bend say things are so bad there, they've actually had patients without COVID die waiting for a hospital bed that was full with a COVID patient. This is overwhelmed inside Oregon's ICUs. On the highway west of Redmond, a cry for help. St. Charles Medical implores people to get the COVID vaccine, reminding them 97% of patients who ended up in the hospital did not have it. Some who ignore the plea end up here, at the main hospital in Bend, which handles trauma cases for three counties in Central Oregon, you doing okay? and now is filling up with some very sick COVID patients. Most of our COVID patients are in the back. In the ICU, lives hang in the balance. Do you need more help? She's calling family. This patient is um, trying to die right now. Uh, we're trying to get a hold of family to let them know that um, transitions are happening. That's Monica Scholes, a nurse and the ICU manager. We were given exclusive access at St. Charles to show you what it's like behind the scenes in the fight against COVID. We've agreed not to identify any of the patients here. Eight are suffering from COVID-19 and are on ventilators. The woman she's talking about is in her 50s and was admitted to the hospital just seven days ago. This patient is still a full code, so we are still gonna continue to do everything. Um, the unfortunate thing is we have nothing left to give. A respiratory therapist inside the hospital room manually pumps air into the patient's body. But it may just be a matter of time before she's gone. They're 100% oxygen, they're fully supported on the ventilator, and um, it's all oxygen related. There's, there's nothing else we can do, so we're trying to get the family to come in and or make them a do not resuscitate. And those are tough, tough decisions. While one team works on that first woman, Another gears up to roll a nearby COVID patient onto their stomach, which helps increase oxygen levels. The COVID patients and the virus within them are kept sealed behind glass. The team carefully layers up to protect themselves. So everybody's got to get all of their gear on. Um, you'll see some are using a N95 and goggles. Others are using the capper shields and masks, which are a positive pressure mask, um, blowing everything out so that they don't get anything in, and the gowns and the double glove, just so that if they rip a glove that they're not exposed. And then they always check each other to make sure everything is the way it should be before they go in, so that nobody risks contamination. It's quite the operation. The procedure takes at least four nurses. The patient is limp and looks lifeless. I asked Monica if they are aware of what's happening. And are most of these people aware of what's happening? This no. They're not aware at all. Um, they're sedated and paralyzed if we're doing this so that we have absolute control that they can't fight us to turn 
um, and possibly dislodge the airway. Dislodging the airway could kill the patient. It's a delicate procedure. One of the team inside is Christy Meckers, a nurse with 11 years experience. She's here on her day off to help the ICU. The gear is hard to work in. In the, the helmets, you can't hear because the air comes right out. And the masks and the goggles, we get a little claustrophobic and you can't see. So it's hard. Gotta get a new one. Across the hall, nurse Peggy Vanderzen took a moment while monitoring a third very sick COVID patient. She's seen several suddenly take a turn for the worse. And there's not much we can do. You know, we think they might be getting a little bit better. And just like my patient today, suddenly got totally worse and we're doing everything that we can. And I don't know if that's gonna be enough. You know, so. She believes most people have no idea the gamble they're taking by not getting vaccinated. Yeah, especially with this Delta variant, you know, a lot of our patients aren't making it. You know, they're not making it. Not making it. They're here for weeks, you know, intubated, and, and there's not much we can do. We always have somebody here 24-7 in my role covering the ICU patients. Dr. Louis Davignon is the ICU critical care doctor this day. He said there is a new drug that fights the organ inflammation brought on by COVID, but it's almost impossible to get. There's a national shortage right now of tocilizumab, so we can't get that. So a lot of these patients that would have gotten that medication um, you know, earlier, it's not available right now. We have calls out, so there's medications we'd like to give that we can't give because of the just the national surge in patients and the demands on the medications. Nurse Meckers has little patience for those who refuse to believe what she experiences every day. For the people that don't believe, it doesn't matter whether or not you believe. The reality is what we're doing to somebody to help them live, it's still happening. They have all the tubes, all the lines, all the full support and everything we can do. And whether or not you believe COVID is real, it, that person's real sick. Away from the fight to save lives in the ICU, leaders at St. Charles agonize over the fact that COVID patients are taking beds needed by other patients who are only slightly less sick. And they expect many more in the coming weeks. We're in trouble. Uh, we're in trouble like every other hospital in Oregon. And Dr. Uh, Doug Merrill is the assistant chief medical officer for the four St. Charles hospitals. He said the ripple effect is potentially widespread. When the hospital is full, Cancer patients and heart patients and others cannot get preventative surgeries. They would need to stay overnight, and there's simply no room. Do you worry there are people out in the community that are going to die because they weren't able to get this care? We know that there are people out in the community who have died because they haven't been able to get this care. And yes, it's already I'm, happened. Yeah, it's already happening, and I'm very worried that it's going to continue to get worse. Dr. Merrill said the hospital used to do as many as 30 elective surgeries a day where patients would recover overnight. Now that number is closer to five. Not everyone in St. Charles is a COVID patient, but their numbers appear to be on a relentless march upward. So we have a 50 bed medical unit. I visited a floor where COVID patients not quite sick enough for the ICU are kept. All of these rooms on the end of this, uh, of our unit are filled with um, COVID positive patients that we're caring for down here. Manager Megan Boyle said 35 of the 50 beds were taken by COVID patients and she expects soon COVID patients will fill all 50. The St. Charles Emergency Room is where many patients begin their journey into the hospital. Those who are able to walk up have to wait outside until a triage nurse like Jackie Bass checks them out. She's wearing the air filtering mask to protect herself from the COVID patients. But her bigger fear is where to put everyone who needs help. It's extremely scary because you have multiple people coming in at multiple times. So when you have limited resources, and limited bed space, who goes next and who goes first? Who's your sickest patient? It's extremely frightening for the community and for us. If they're in crisis, they come here. The continued arrival of COVID patients, most not vaccinated, is draining. It's exhausting. It's uh, frustrating. Um, the majority of the people that are coming in are regretting not getting the vaccine. 
Jose Pacheco is a nurse in the ER. He's had patients who still refuse to believe the COVID virus is a threat or even real. Yeah, a lot of them are still um, dead set on their beliefs and their opinions. Um, if there is any exchange, when you try to educate, there's, you're gonna get some negative feedback, unfortunately. The helicopter might be coming in. ER doctor Jillian Salton has seen an endless stream of COVID patients and is like many on the front lines, burned out. Uh, I'm angry at, at everything. I'm angry at uh, patients who chose not to get vaccinated. I'm angry at the health system for not being able to handle it, even if it's not their fault. I'm angry at myself for not having done more early in the pandemic. Uh, yeah. And maybe There's, angry at yourself for being angry? Yes, very much so. Yeah, it's, it's hard. She's haunted by the fact that there are people in the community not getting the care they need because of COVID patients. What keeps me up at night are the patients who aren't getting their surgery for their colon cancer because we're full of COVID patients. And um, that's, you know, that's what I lie awake thinking about every night. I think about the patients that I am discharging from the emergency department who normally would be admitted to the hospital but I've got no place to put them. So we say, well, just go home and hope you don't die. Wow. Yeah. She later changed that to come back if you get sicker, but you get the idea. The doctors, nurses, everyone, it seems, are tired, frustrated, and angry enough to start saying out loud what they've been thinking privately for a long time. None of this would be happening if those eligible just got vaccinated. Many never imagined healthcare would take a turn like this it's common now for them to think about leaving the profession. Have you thought about getting out? Yeah. Really? I think everyone's probably thought about getting out right now. Yeah. Wow. ER doctor Suzanne Demeester told me getting the COVID vaccine was one of the happiest moments in her life. She was stunned to learn many refused to take it. I asked what it's like to leave the hospital in constant battle with the COVID virus, then see people in the grocery store not wearing masks. It's hard. Um, I walk around grocery stores looking at people and wondering what they look like when they're gonna get in the ICU. Um, it's pretty difficult to deal with. What's the nitric up? Back at the ICU, the body language of the nurses trying to save the woman in her 50s suggests resignation. They are out of options. We have three patients that are doing very poorly this afternoon, and I expect that probably not any of them will make it through the night. Both the woman in her 50s and a second COVID patient here, neither one vaccinated, died by 7 p.m. Another hard day in the ICU. So there have been a lot of really hard days since then as well. Things are not getting better. They're still getting worse. See, I can't even imagine being a healthcare worker right now in these ICUs. You're spending your entire career caring about people, caring for people, really putting compassion into everything you do. And then people just keep coming in, in the door, in the door. I can't even imagine. Yeah, and that's part of what is really kind of getting to them. They love their patients typically, and they feel good about them, and they have empathy, and they pull for them to get better, and a lot of them do. And here, a lot of them are not getting better and they're coming into the hospital because of choices that they're making to not get vaccinated. And it's so hard, the healthcare workers are starting to resent these patients. And then they feel awful for resenting them. And how did I get here in my profession? And it just becomes this really nasty circle. So I'm just curious, you know, you've seen a lot. You've, you've been around, you've reported on so many different things. When you walked into that ICU, what struck you? Well, it was very calm and very orderly. And then it wasn't. When the patients started to go downhill, people were moving and there were, you know, teams gowning up and going in and doing all that stuff. And it was, uh, you know, it was striking how professional they were, but they kept trying these different things and none of them were working. And when it was all over, they were saying, you know, there's only so much we can do. Once you get here, we're just trying to stabilize you so your body can fight this thing off. And with a lot of people, does not end well. The hospitals are full. The same thing here at OHSU in the medical ICU. Coming up, we're going to be talking to nurses here. We're going to be going into the medical ICU for the first time to see the reality 
of these healthcare workers. There's always a nurse kind of right here ready to intervene uh, at any moment. The life of a nurse in OHSU's medical intensive care unit is exhausting. So we're constantly assessing heart rate, blood pressure, oxygen levels. We're monitoring the waveforms on the ventilator to... ICU charge nurse Erin Bonai showed us the reality that healthcare workers are facing, an ICU full of COVID patients. They lay motionless in hospital beds, hooked up to machines that are keeping them alive. These are the sickest of the sickest patients. Every single patient on this unit right now has a breathing tube. It's a scene people outside of the medical field don't often see, but it's happening in hospitals all over Oregon, says ICU nurse Julie Cleese. We don't have any space in our unit physically to put a patient. People from all over the Pacific seaboard come here to OHSU to get medical treatment from Alaska to Idaho to Montana, and not to mention the rural hospitals that rely on the doctors here and their expertise. This is the go-to place for serious medical conditions. Our physicians are just being called at every opportunity. Can you take this patient? Can you help us consult on this patient? This patient is 26 and dying. This patient is 21 and dying. This patient is a father of four and dying. You know, can you help us? Our rural partners are struggling. They're at the limit of their capabilities and that's when they turn to us and the inn is full. Add to that, pre-pandemic staffing shortages make the job that much harder with still more healthcare workers leaving because they're so burnt out. These patients require more hands-on staff um, and more direct nursing care. Um, so I think it exacerbated some staffing issues that we were having prior. Something that seems as simple as flipping a patient to help their lungs inflate and increase their chances of survival is a tedious and dangerous process with all the tubes, requiring more than just one person. Nurses are taking on extra shifts and working themselves into the ground, all to help their patients, almost all of whom chose not to get the vaccine. While we were there, only one patient out of 14 had been vaccinated. I don't think people have an inkling of the amount of suffering that you will experience being sick with COVID. It is extremely painful. Um, being critically ill is um, a very traumatizing experience. It is confusing, it's scary, you're alone with strangers, you don't recognize their voices. You lose your free will um, being in the hospital. That suffering isn't just limited to the people in these hospital beds, it extends to their family. If they get to see you, whether it's on a video camera or in person, they will see you suffer greatly. Um, and it's really unnecessary. I mean, it's totally avoidable. I think that's the most heartbreaking part of it. Because it's too risky to have family members visit COVID-19 patients, in their time of death, they're often alone, save for a nurse at their bedside who becomes their family in that moment. It's a near impossible and heart-wrenching task. What can you say? I know the depth of grief that I would feel if I couldn't be with my loved one as they died. So I take the responsibility very seriously to love that person as if they were my own family member um, and provide them with a death that's dignified and honorable as much as possible in an ICU that is sterile and cold and and forgiving. So it really is something else to be here in the ICU in person. You know, you hear about it all the time. I've heard it via Zoom from doctors and nurses, what it's like, but it's entirely different being here in person. Right now I'm looking at a 20-something year old woman, 
hooked up to so many tubes, her blood going in and out of her body, becoming oxygenated. These tubes are thick, they're big, and in the corner of her room, stuffed animals, presumably from family members, and it's just heartbreaking. The reality is that we maybe have one person in their 70s here and everybody else is in their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We see plenty of people who are fully functional, no blaring underlying conditions, who did not think that they, certainly did not think that they were at risk of severe impacts from COVID-19. And they are here fighting for their lives. Down the hall, in another room, photos line the wall. We've blurred faces for privacy, but the people in them are smiling. They look like family members, friends. The man smiling in many of those photos now lies a few feet away, nearly unresponsive in a hospital bed. And I just wish people could hear it, that if you're worried about side effects from the vaccine itself, your risks of what can happen to you or your loved one if you do not get vaccinated are astronomically higher. And the frustration around people who refuse to get the vaccine keeps growing. It feels really frustrating and angering because this is a medical issue and it seems like something medical or what a medical policy could have fixed or helped has now become completely political. Beyond frustrating, you know, like, you know, I had to call over to the pediatric ICU one day and ask for a beanie baby to give to a 12 year old while I turned off the support and her dad died. Like, I don't want to do that. You know, you know, you're holding the hands of a, a pregnant wife whose husband is fighting for his life. Like, who wants to do that? You know, and it's 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 overwhelming and it just keeps happening and it doesn't stop. And there is no end. We see no end. So it's like. What do you do? ICU nurse Emily Williams has seen a lot. She's cared for people after a mass shooting, but she says this is another level, with people staying in the ICU for weeks or months. If this continues, other people who need medical help won't be getting it. If we are full of COVID, where do these people think that the other people are going to go? We don't have hospitals for non-COVID. We don't have magical places for people to go. Even more frustrating? Some people not accepting the reality of what's happening in our hospitals. It kind of feels like the world just gaslighting you, like they don't believe your experience. Like this is, why don't they believe what we are experiencing and what we're telling them? Like it's, it's just so frustrating. It takes an emotional toll on you. And I think what we've asked nurses to do during this time uh, is not, it's not fair, you know, like we, to care that much for that long under such duress has been really hard on, on us. I'm really proud that I've continued to show up. It's devastating. It's really heartbreaking knowing that people are fighting for their lives um, and it could have been prevented. At the end of her day, Bonai, like many of her colleagues, doesn't have much more to give. Often exhausted and defeated and sad if I'm honest. Americans who hesitate to get the vaccine, asking our nurses and doctors to shoulder the unbelievable weight of deaths and illnesses that are preventable. This doesn't have to happen to anybody anymore. And that's what we keep hearing over and over again is to get that vaccine, especially from healthcare workers, because by doing so, you're really alleviating a lot of the stress that has been placed on them. Yeah, people coming in, vaccinated, very rare. What's been your reaction uh, online, especially to your story? Oh, um, I would say the vast majority of people are so supportive. And I would say a lot of the healthcare workers that messaged me are so glad that people are finally getting a chance to see what their reality looks like day in and day out. And then you've got the average Oregonian or even people outside of Oregon who are tuning in saying, hey, thank you for, for giving people a glimpse into these ICUs. Well, this has been our special report on the COVID crisis that's enveloping our entire state. Thanks to all the medical professionals, the doctors, the nurses, everyone who allowed us into their world so that we could give you a glimpse of that as well. And thanks to you from all of us here at KGW for watching.